This is Lesson 22.4, Science and Thought. How and why did intellectual life change in this period? College Board Topic 6.3, Second Wave Industrialization and Its Effects. Explain how innovations and advances in technology during the Industrial Revolutions, that's plural, led to economic and social change. There was a second Industrial Revolution. Mechanization and the factory system became predominant modes of production by 1914. New technologies and means of communication and transportation, including railroads, resulted in more fully integrated national economies, a higher level of urbanization, and a truly global economic network. New efficient methods of transportation and other innovations created new technologies, improved the distribution of goods, increased consumerism, and enhanced the quality of life. College Board Topic 7.1, Contextualizing 19th Century Perspectives and Political Developments. Explain the context in which nationalistic and imperialistic sentiments developed in Europe from 1815 to 1914. European ideas and culture expressed a tension between objectivity and scientific realism on one hand and subjectivity and individual expression on the other. Following the revolutions of 1848, Europe turned toward a realist and materialist worldview. College Board Topic 7.4, Darwinism and Social Darwinism. Explain how Darwin's theories influenced scientific and social developments from 1815 to 1914. Charles Darwin provided a scientific and material account of biological change and the development of human beings as a species, and inadvertently, a justification for racialist theories that became known as social Darwinism. College Board Topic 7.8, 19th Century Culture and Art, explain the continuities and changes in European artistic expression from 1815 to 1914. Realist and materialist themes and attitudes influenced art and literature as painters and writers depicted the lives of ordinary people and drew attention to social problems. Place, Great Britain, Germany, France, the 1850s to the 1890s. Key people in science and thought, Charles Darwin, Emile Durkheim, Gustav Le Bon, Max Weber, and Herbert Spencer. Key concepts in science and thought, thermodynamics, evolution, social Darwinism, realism, and the second industrial revolution. We see two big intellectual changes going on from the 1850s to the 1890s. First, scientific knowledge was exploding in chemistry, physics, electricity, and this almost gets its own big intellectual change, biology and genetics. There's also a shift from romanticism to realism, and it marks a certain acceptance of the fact that change has come and it's here to stay. So let's use art to improve what is, not going back to what was. What do science and art have in common? They have the goal of improving society. Before 1830, science played a smaller role in industry than you might think. After the 1830s, science really started improving things for regular people. This was the second industrial revolution. Thanks to people like Louis Pasteur, biology and medicine became whole new industries. And we had the laws of thermodynamics. Thermodynamics studies the relationship between heat and mechanical energy. How do you transform heat into mechanical energy? The laws of conservation and energy state that energy can be converted from one form to another. But energy can be neither created nor destroyed. Energy such as heat, electricity, magnetism, and chemical processes. The laws of thermodynamics were formulated by the 1850s and they were built on Newton's laws of mechanics. They were also built on the study of steam engines. And the connection between the first and second industrial revolutions was indeed the steam engine. Thermodynamics was being applied to all kinds of different fields. Chemistry during this time. Atomic weights could be measured. The periodic table was codified. Chemistry broke up into specialized branches, organic, inorganic, etc. German chemists repurposed tar from furnaces into synthetic dyes. Electricity. It was used in telecommunications, 
and it was used in electrochemistry and used for power generation. Petroleum. Petroleum competed with steam and electricity. It was in wide use by the 1890s, and it was used, of course, for the internal combustion engine. Ongoing R&D, research and development, accompanied production. And there were consequences to the second industrial revolution. Science became more important and more relevant to the popular mind. And the implications of science and industry to society, such as ethical considerations, became more popular. Scientific methods gained prestige. Science was now truth. Science was objective. And art, humanities, and religion were seen as inferior to science. Darwin and natural selection. Scientific discoveries were challenging traditional thinking. First, we had Charles Lyell. He came up with the principle of uniformitarianism. And uniformitarianism said that geological processes formed the Earth's surface very slowly over a vast amount of time. And that made the Earth a whole lot older than people had thought. And this was highly influential to Charles Darwin. Then you had Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. And he said that all forms of life emerged as they were adapting to their environment. Darwin took this adapting idea much further. Lamarck emphasized adaptation, but Darwin emphasized survival. Darwin proposed that species evolve from other species out of their struggle to survive. And he published his famous book on the origin of the species by means of natural selection. He was influenced by Charles Lyell and by Thomas Malthus. Darwin said that an organism might be born with some genetic anomaly, which just so happens to give it an edge. Or it might have some genetic anomaly which just so happens to give it a disadvantage. The organism with the edge will survive and pass that same edge to its offspring. But the organism with the liability will die before it can pass that liability onto its offspring. Therefore, the organism with the good trait will be naturally selected for survival. The organism with the bad trait will be naturally selected for extinction. Darwin basically implied that if there is a God, he's not doing anything to drive biological development. It's all happening by the chance interplay between heredity and environment. And the convergence of those two things is what drives the development of new species, and that's it. Herbert Spencer and Social Darwinism In a way, Herbert Spencer is following the almost 200-year-old tradition of the Enlightenment. He's taking scientific principles in biology and applying them to human institutions. In that way, he's no different from Locke or Voltaire or Rousseau or Montesquieu or Adam Smith. Spencer asked, what if you took the scientific concepts of Darwin? Survival of the fittest, heredity and environment, natural selection, and applied those to modern man what might we discover? Of course, Spencer will take his prejudices and his biases with him. That's part of the Enlightenment. Incidentally, Herbert Spencer actually used the term survival of the fittest first after reading Charles Darwin's book, Principles of Biology, published in 1864. And it was suggested to Darwin that this was an easier term to understand than the term natural selection. So Darwin started using it also. For Spencer, Darwin's struggle for survival was an economic and racial struggle. Those people who appear to be thriving in the struggle for economic survival, they must have inherent genetic traits that made them more fit to win in the harsh economic environment. Those people who seem to be floundering, the ones who never seem to get anywhere, they're the ones who must have inherent genetic traits that make them unfit to survive. And if you want to obey the wisdom of nature, then the ones who are fit to survive should survive. And the ones who are unfit to survive shouldn't survive. So whatever you do to help the unfit is a waste of time. Nature has already made the call. Whatever you do to enhance the position of your own people and degrade the position of those other people is natural and right. 
nationalists picked up on social Darwinism. They could now give you all kinds of reasons from social Darwinism why their country or ethnic group was more fit to succeed than those other people. Imperialists picked up on social Darwinism. They could now give you all kinds of reasons from social Darwinism why Europeans should subjugate all non-Europeans. In fact, social Darwinism is going to have a big future in front of it in the 19th, 20th, and even 21st centuries. The Modern University and Society in the 1880s Universities were changing. They were more modernized. They were more diversified. And they emphasized social sciences as well as the hard sciences. And these social science departments started to crunch government data about society. And a new science called sociology emerged. The main focus was capitalism and its effect on society. If we can understand capitalism, can we improve people's lives? Max Weber, he was a German. He had a different take on capitalism than many others. For him, thoughts and ideas were real things. Ideas had power. Ideas had consequences. And he proposed that capitalism was most prevalent in Northern Europe for a reason. Protestantism was also prevalent in Northern Europe. And Protestantism teaches hard work, it teaches saving, it teaches investing, and it teaches that worldly success means that God approves of you. And these values make capitalism possible. He also criticized capitalism. Capitalism robs the individual of his heart and soul. The person becomes just a machine who does the same thing all day long. Emile Durkheim, he was French and he was an atheist, but at the same time he was fascinated by religion. Most atheists want nothing to do with religion or are even hostile to it, but Durkheim was curious about it. He didn't judge people who believed in it. He did pioneering scientific studies on how religion worked in the mind and in society. Durkheim, like all sociologists, was also fascinated by capitalism. And he said that capitalism takes away all the things that religion provides. And he called this anomie, rootlessness. Even if capitalism does make you rich, the alienation effect of capitalism makes everybody extremely unhappy. And capitalism can kill. In 1897, he published a study on suicide and he explained why suicide was rising along with modernity. Durkheim was very concerned with the amount of freedom in modern society. He believed that freedom and relativism create a feeling of alienation. And he had a real problem with the whatever works for you message. Do what feels right to you. Believe what you want to believe. All of that has a dual meaning for Durkheim. The positive side of the message was, you're free. You can do whatever you want in this modern society. But the negative side of that same message is this. There's a concrete reason why society lets you be so free and so unencumbered. And it's because society doesn't really care what you think or do. Society doesn't really care about you. And even if it did care, society doesn't have any answers or directions for you. There were two big themes for early sociologists. Number one, alienation. Living in a society that doesn't know you or need you. And two, the loss of individuality. Gustave Le Bon. Gustave Le Bon studied crowd psychology. He was concerned that the individual could turn over his individuality to the emotions of the crowd. In crowds, humans are more anonymous, less personally responsible, and more suggestible. In 1895, Gustave Le Bon predicted that just one charismatic, manipulative leader could possibly figure out how to harness a group's psychology for his own ends. And he suggested that there might be no limit to how violent and destructive that kind of power could be. Let's think on that one. Realism. In the 1840s, 
to the 1890s. The Romantics had had a romanticized view, and the Realists had a realistic view. The best way I can describe the goal of realism is this. Let's get a look at the ordinary, the typical, the commonplace, and shine a light on it. Make the people notice it and contemplate it like they never otherwise would have. And whatever people don't like, they can go out into the real world and change. In that way, art has great power to change the world. Romanticism cannot affect change like this. Realism accepts that the industrial age is here to stay. You're never going to turn the clock back to the pre-industrial middle ages. But you can change the now, and you can make it a better now. The favorite subject of realism? The working class. Working class everything. Working class sex. Working class labor strikes. Working class slums. Working class violence. Working class alcoholism. Working class work. Realism was also in the theater. This is a picture of Chekhov's The Cherry Orchard on stage. Naturalism. Naturalism was an extreme form of realism in which artists and writers tried to depict ordinary slices of life. For playwrights and novelists, it might mean creating the most authentic and ordinary dialogue they possibly could. For artists, it meant capturing the most ordinary moment, almost like a photograph would. This is a painting called Paying the Harvesters, and it captures just an ordinary moment in time when people are collecting their money for a hard day's work. Realists wanted to present an accurate as possible mirror of the world to inspire people to change things. And in order to do that, their novels and paintings were often carefully researched. They wanted to attain as much authenticity as possible. If you were painting a particular class of people, you needed to do your homework and study that class of people. If you were writing about a particular work environment, you needed to thoroughly understand what goes on there. 